during the 2005 elections. He was first freely elected mayor of Addis in 2005 election, and along with all the leadership of the city, uh, Burhanu Nega, who is a Bucknell University uh, associate professor uh, of economics. He is also current chairman of Gimbat 7. The Movement for Justice, Freedom, and Democracy is one of the leaders of the Coalition for Unity and Democracy and served as campaign manager for the party's successful effort during the 2005 elections. He was first freely elected mayor of Addis in 2005 election, and along with all the leadership of the CUD, uh, he served 21 months in prison after winning the election. I would note parenthetically that when Greg and I uh, visited in 2005, uh, Dr. Nega and Greg got in a car to go one place, I got in a car to go somewhere else, and right behind them, ubiquitous to, to, to the core, was a group of secret police who monitored every move that they made, uh, and it was, it was just telling. Uh, it was over the top. Dr. Peter Pham, uh, again, uh, uh, welcome back, Dr. Pham, director of the Michael S. Ansari Africa Center at the Atlantic Council in Washington. He is incumbent vice president of the Association for the Study of Middle East and Africa, an academic organization that represents more than a thousand scholars, and is editor-in-chief of the organization's Journal of the Middle East and Africa. Dr. Fan uh, was the winner of the 2008 Nelson Mandela International Prize for African Security and Development. He has authored half a dozen books, chapters concerning Somali piracy, terrorism, and stabilizing fragile states, as well as more than 80 articles in various journals. Uh, we'll then hear from um, Mr. Obang Metho, Solidarity Movement for a New Ethiopia. Mr. Metho is the executive director of the Solidarity Movement for the New Ethiopia, a social justice movement of diverse uh, interests. He is tirelessly advocated for human rights, justice, and freedom, the environment, and enhanced accountability in politics and peace in Africa for over 10 years. He has briefed and met with leaders and officials at the UN, European Parliament, State Department, US Congress, and the World Bank, and the Council for Foreign Relations, among others. He defends the fundamental respect for human life and is committed to work for the reconciliation, forgiveness, and healings of affected people in order to create positive uh, future. Then we'll hear from uh, Mr. Adote Akwe, who is Amnesty International's Managing Director for Government Relations uh, for AI International. He joined, uh, rejoined Amnesty in 2010 after serving as Senior Policy Advisor for CARE. In this capacity, Mr. Uh, Akwe helped develop and implement advocacy on CARE's priority issues towards the U.S. government. Uh, before joining CARE, uh, he worked with Amnesty International USA for 11 years. He also served as Africa's director for the Lawyers Committee of Human Rights, now Human Rights First, and previously served as a research and human rights director for the American Committee on Africa and the Africa Fund. So, uh, Dr. Nega, if you could begin. Sorry. Good morning, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Bass, distinguished members of the House Subcommittee on Africa. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. It is indeed a great honor and privilege to have the opportunity to appear before you to discuss issues related to the future of democracy and human rights in Ethiopia. Democracy and human rights have direct implications for Ethiopia's survival as a nation. The existence of a democratically elected and accountable government that strictly adheres to the rule of law and respects the basic rights of its citizens is the only arrangement that will ensure Ethiopia's stability and prosperity in the long run. A stable and prosperous Ethiopia contributes to the prosperity and stability of the region. An unstable Ethiopia has the potential to destabilize the Horn of Africa. Issues ranging from religious extremism, potential conflict over freshwater usage, crippling poverty, and looming environmental challenges could threaten the livelihood of the people in the region, and such challenges require the attention and resources of the international community in partnership with responsible and accountable leaders in the region. It is therefore in the economic and national security interest of the U.S. and its Western allies to ensure that Ethiopia achieves durable stability, which can only come from genuine democratization, rather than settle for a short-term, tenuous peace that is falsely projected by dictatorships and that could collapse with the slightest challenge from a fed-up and angry populace. Having said that as an introduction, let me quickly and directly address the topic at hand. There are three interrelated issues. The first deals with the government's observance of human rights and democratic principles after the days of Mullis. This is a topic that is least controversial, and I have addressed it in detail in the written testimony that I have submitted for the record. Suffice it to say that in every major category of human rights, 
and democratization, things are as bad as they were during Mullah's tenure, or even worse in some cases. Award-winning journalists are languishing in jail. Ethiopia is very close to Iran, Cuba, and Somalia in the number of journalists jailed or exiled. As a cruel reminder of the elections in communist Soviet Union, the ruling party allegedly won 99.6% of the parliamentary seats under Mullah's in 2010. As if to outdo Mullah's, in the most recent local elections, the ruling party and its allies won all of the 3.8 million seats. The Independent Election Commission called it a manifestation of the maturity of Ethiopian democracy. The government is simply allergic to the presence of independent civil organizations. It decides on who should be the leaders of religious institutions and has the audacity even to attempt to pressure Ethiopian Muslims to abandon their faith and convert to a new sect that it somehow favors. It purposely fosters conflict among different cultural and religious communities. Ethnic cleansing of the Amhara from the south and Ben Shangul regions, which started under Mullahs, hasn't stopped. The forced eviction of indigenous people from the Omo Valley and Gambella regions has intensified. The judiciary, like all state institutions, is completely captured to a point where the faith that people might have in finding justice through formal state institutions has been obliterated. Mr. Chairman, the potential for reforms under the current government, which forms the second part of this discussion, is at once very critical as well as potentially controversial because the discussion about the future by its very nature is speculative. In my mind, this issue has two parts. The first is my own assessment of the possibility of reform under the current regime. The second is a follow-up to the first. If there is no reforms, what is going to happen to Ethiopia in the future? Let me address both of these issues candidly. Much as I wish it, I don't see the possibility of an internally driven reform leading to a genuine democratic dispensation in Ethiopia. The ruling clique have committed too many human rights crimes, have accumulated too much wealth through rampant corruption, and have antagonized the population too much to feel that they can continue to enjoy a peaceful life after relinquishing power, which they know would happen if there was to be a truly free and fair election. Instead, they believe that they can somehow survive through total repression insofar as they can get the foreign aid resources as well as the diplomatic support they need to help them keep the lead on any potential resistance to their power. The only change that Mellis's death has brought to this situation is that it has revealed the tenuous nature of this calculation as it has exposed the internal conflict and bickering within the ruling coalition. This takes me to the second part of the issue. So what is going to happen if there is no possibility of reform coming from the government? Will Ethiopians simply accept tyranny and leave this humiliating existence indefinitely? If I know anything about the Ethiopian character, that is one bet I am not willing to take. That is why, unfortunately, my assessment is rather pessimistic. I think the government's capacity for that total repression is going to be challenged rather dramatically in the near future. As the government simply refuses to reform, intensifies its repression, deliberately decimates the legal opposition, and continues to antagonize people in all parts of the country, armed resistance has become an acceptable form of struggle. The various armed groups have started to talk seriously about unifying their actions and their vision of for a democratic future as the public's attention shifts from the peaceful opposition to the armed groups as their last best hope for ending their humiliation and freeing themselves from tyranny. Mr. Chairman, it is painful to see my country go through such turmoil in order to achieve the most basic rights that all people in this day and age routinely expect and deserve. I wish there could be a peaceful way out of this quagmire, but I feel that is unlikely. This has serious implications for U.S. foreign policy. The current policy of shoring up and bankrolling authoritarian rule with the hope that it could achieve a modicum of stability in the region is going to face a serious challenge. Will the U.S. and its allies continue to support a brutal regime that is sure to be unstable as the armed resistance against it intensifies? Will such support ensure the stability of the regime over the long run? If the opposition is committed to a pluralist, democratically elected government in Ethiopia, wouldn't it be better and more durable ally than the current regime? This takes me to my last point regarding what the U.S. can do to ensure reforms. If reform leading to genuine democratization is sought, clearly the policy followed by the U.S. and its allies in the past 21 years has not worked. 
the policy of constructive engagement, which hopes to cajole the government to implement some reforms in exchange for financial and diplomatic support, has simply failed to achieve its objective. Instead, the current policy might unwittingly increase instability in Ethiopia. On the other hand, there is a very strong argument, both on national security and humanitarian grounds, to keep the situation from deteriorating even further. Contrary to prevailing wisdom in the West, the Ethiopian government is amenable to pressure, especially financial pressure. A coordinated, no-nonsense financial pressure that conditions Western aid on clear, targeted, measurable, time-bound political reforms that could lead to a democratic dispensation is, in my view, the only mechanism that could avert the potential crisis that is looming in Ethiopia. Mr. Chairman, working toward such an out outcome is not only the right thing to do, but also the smart thing to do. The world community has enough experience by now to know that doing nothing at the early stages of a crisis would lead to extremely costly letter. A crisis is looming in Ethiopia. And if we act wisely now, we can avoid a lot of pain and suffering later. I hope the United States will play its part to bring about a peaceful and sustainable solution. Such an outcome is good for the international community, good for regional stability, and certainly good for Ethiopia. I know, Mr. Chairman, under your leadership, your committee and this House will do its part for the well-being of the Ethiopian people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your question.